Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our third session of Project Echo Safer Clean During COVID 19. It's brought to you by the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health. I am Dr. Jessica Urbina, and I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. We are Region 6 of the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Teams, and that encompasses the states of Texas, New Mexico, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. And we'd like to direct you to our national website for further resources on topics of pediatric environmental health through webinars, online courses, and a resource catalog that contains materials for parents, community members, patients, and providers. For educational and dissemination purposes, we will be recording the lecture portion of this video session. The, um, the scenario or case discussions at the end of the lecture will not be recorded, so please feel welcome to speak freely. We would like to let you know that Project ECHO does collect information such as that uh, that you provided during the registration. Your individual data will be kept confidential and uh, it will be used for reports and quality assurance, evaluation and research, and to inform new initiatives. If you have any questions, please feel free to email. This material was supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics and funded in part by a cooperative agreement with the um, Agency for to Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. This falls plus the Environmental Protection Agency and I just want to note that neither the EPA nor the ATSDR endorsed the purchase of any commercial products or services mentioned in the PACE publication. Now, I would like to ask that everybody mute their mics simply because if we do have background noise, it, it will um, interfere with everybody's ability to speak, to hear the active speaker. So please mute your mics. Thank you. Just a little bit about us, the focus of this project ECHO is to disseminate information about the pediatric risks from chemicals and cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing agents. The overall goals of the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health are to reduce the environmental health threats to children, expand access to environmental to pediatric environmental medicine expertise, strengthen capacities through education and expanded collaborative relationships, and deliver relevant education and consultations to address environmental health threats to children. Our current projects include this project, the Project ECHO, and a train the trainer model where we are developing a flipbook that can be used as an educational tool by community health workers to disseminate information on the dangers to pediatric environmental health from certain chemicals in household cleaning agents. For our six sessions, this is our third session where we will be where we will be learning and discussing COVID-19 vaccines and variants. Our subsequent sessions will will be on August 25th, cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing the home. That will be presented by myself. On September 8th, we will have protecting children in the home from household chemical dangers pre pre presented by Dr. Sarah Watkins. And on the 22nd of September, EPA safer choice alternatives that will be presented by Dr. Sal Baez. I hope everybody uh, can register. Here we have the QR codes and the links for registration. Some helpful tips. As I mentioned before, please mute your microphone during the presentation. You are able to mute and unmute yourself during the case or scenario discussion. So after our presentation, please feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or something that you want to um, talk about. You can also, if you don't feel comfortable speaking up, you can also add any questions to the Q&A or the chat. And uh, what I know myself will we'll go ahead and bring those up to our to our panel. If you have any IT issues, please give me a call or email me or chat during the session and, and I'll uh, try to help out there. At the end of our session, we will have a, a survey. Please, please do complete it. It helps us improve our future echo sessions to know what's working, to know what's not working. And we'd like to thank you for your participation as well. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Susan Buchanan. She's the director of the Great Lakes Center for Children's and Reproductive Environmental Health and the Clinical Associate Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health. She is an expert in health problems related to toxic substances and other environmental hazards in the workplace or community. Her research interests include the health of minority, low-income, and immigrant workers, both children and reproductive environmental health. She has studies on the impact of fish consumption and mercury exposure in the Asian communities in Chicago and the use of protective gear among Latino day laborers and lead exposure among Chicago's children. 
just a quick note that Chicago is my hometown. That's where I was born. Uh, so please welcome Dr. Buchanan. I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that nice introduction. I'm now going to share my slides and um, we're not going to talk about toxic substances this today, except for the very toxic substance COVID-19, um, the virus. I'm also um, involved with the pediatric environmental health specialty units. So the, the centers that are, are giving this echo were a network around the country. So I have spent a lot of time on children's environmental health. But I'm also an occupational medicine physician, so I've spent a lot of time in the last year and a half talking about, thinking about, learning about COVID-19. So I've been giving a lot of town hall um, talks like this to people in communities that have lots of questions. <clears throat> These slides are about the Delta variant, and we're going to leave lots of time for questions because I know people may have a lot of questions about vaccines and the virus in general. <clears throat> the objectives here are that you'll be able to distinguish the Delta variant from other SARS-CoV-2 variants. You'll be able to relate information on vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 and explain that children are at higher risk of infection because they are not vaccinated yet. So <clears throat> let's talk about what is the Delta variant. This picture shows that the graphic that we've all seen for the last year and a half about what the coronavirus looks like, what this particular type of coronavirus, which is called COVID, looks like, and it has these little spike proteins all around the outside. The Delta variant of the coronavirus is a teeny little change in the DNA within that spike protein of the coronavirus. Um, so it is still a COVID 19 virus. So it's still the same virus. It just has a little bit of a difference on its spike protein. And as we'll see, you know, it means that it behaves a little bit differently than the previous variant. But another name, another word for variant is mutation. So this Delta variant is a mutation from the original COVID-19 that has slowly over the last year and a half mutated little by little. And this one's getting a lot of attention because it's causing a lot of infections. So what these bars show you is how Delta, which is in red, increased over time. So each one of these colors is a different genetic form of COVID-19 virus. So at the beginning last May, Alpha was the major one that was seen in the US, the major type. But Delta was there, it just wasn't, there wasn't very much of it at all. So there's also a gamma variant or mutation, an iota, and there are other mutations called variants. And this shows each bar as the time passed from May up until July, um, how Delta became a bigger proportion of all the infections in the US, and now it's up over 90%. I just couldn't find an updated graphic. For some reason, nobody's put it onto a graph, but that red right now at the beginning um, early part of August is the most of that bar on the right would be completely red. So Delta has pretty much taken over in the United States. Here's another map. This one again is from July 17th. So it's um, not completely updated, but it shows the different areas of the country where Delta became prevalent and the percentage. So that dark brown right in the middle of the country shows where Delta variant was already made up over 90% of the COVID-19 infections in July. Um, I'm here in the pink, I'm in the pink area in Illinois where we are now also over 90% and uh, the rest of the country is as well. So this would be a very boring graph or now it would be all, it would be um, all dark brown. So why is, why does this little bitty genetic change make this COVID-19 virus act different than those previous mutations? This one is 50 to 60% more transmissible. So what that means is um, from this graphic over here on the right, you see see the blue bar is the original strain of COVID-19. And so uh, can you guys see my cursor up here? Okay, so this is one person that got infected. They can get, they infect an average two other people because the virus 
um, was, was, you know, travels through the air or they cough on two other people or cough on other people and two of them will get sick. Those two people will get two to three other people. It was 2.5. So, you know, two and a half people, these people will get two other, two and a half other people sick and onward until when you get down here to this fourth generation, you've got this many people sick with COVID-19. When somebody with Delta coughs on the people around them, they get six to seven other people sick instead of only two to three. Then those six to seven people get six to seven more people sick and onward. So you can see by the time it's been spread through the community, you have a lot more people sick with the Delta variant than you would back um, at the beginning. Now, at the beginning, that we, we thought that was bad because lots of people were dying. Well, this is horrible. This is what's going on now. Lots and lots of infection. Fortunately, sorry, I didn't use that. Fortunately, um, a lot of a very many of the people that are older uh, are vaccinated. So the people who are most susceptible to dying from the virus are not dying of this Delta because 80% um, of the of older people are, vi are vaccinated. So that's fantastic. So not only is this more transmissible, the risk of being hospitalized with it is double. So it makes people sicker. So um, your chances of landing in the hospital when you have a Delta infection now, if you're unvaccinated, is double what it was if um, you had gotten sick with COVID-19 a year ago. So that's scary. Um, this just shows the general transmission of coronavirus in, um, at the end of July. Um, once again, showing that most of the country is in high um, transmission, community transmission. That means just how much is there in the community of the disease. So there is a lot. A lot of vulnerable populations have already been vaccinated. So fortunately, their mortality is not as bad as um, the level of community transmission as it was a year ago. There is a question about, is COVID-19 illness more severe with the Delta variant? Like like if you get sick um, with infection, are you getting sicker? And that we're not exactly sure. I just gave that that statistic that you're you have double the chance of landing in the hospital. So it certainly seems like it would be more severe. The issue is the scientists can't exactly figure out what is it about Delta that makes people um, land in the hospital really need more information to say that this virus um, is much stronger and makes you much sicker. Can't really say that yet. Another question that a lot of people have is, do children have a higher risk with the Delta variant? Um, we've heard a lot, especially in Texas, about a lot more children being hospitalized with it. Is there something about kids that's making them at higher risk? And the answer is no, there isn't anything about kids that makes them more likely to get sick with Delta, except that they're not vaccinated. Children under 12 can't get vaccinated. They, it doesn't seem like they're getting sicker than adults who get ill with Delta. But you're hearing about all the hospitalizations because before they just were not getting, they just weren't, there wasn't enough Delta, I mean, sorry, there wasn't enough COVID-19 around that kids were spreading it. Now with the Delta being so much more transmissible, um, they are uh, getting sick a lot more often. CDC, oh, and I left Governor Pritzker, that's our that's our governor here in Illinois, because I had put this slide together for another talk. Um, everybody knows now that the CDC is recommending universal masking in schools here in Illinois. It's gonna be required for all K through 12 education, regardless if kids are vaccinated, they're going to have to wear masks. And I know that is, there's a lot of politics around that, and that's certainly very different for other states depending on who your governor. The symptoms of COVID-19 illness with the Delta variant seem to be a little bit different than with the other variants. With the Delta variant, we're seeing more headache, sore throat, regular old cold symptoms, and fever. Remember at the beginning, people were having um, a really bad cough, dry cough, hacking cough, and a loss of smell and taste. With the Delta variant, it seems like there's less loss of smell and less severe cough and more just regular cold symptoms. What that means is that anybody who's got cold symptoms should get a COVID test. I mean, we need to be testing for any types of these vague symptoms. 
since Delta is just spreading out everywhere. So anybody who's got symptoms of any type of cold, sore throat, headache, that they don't usually get headaches, um, go get a COVID test. So let's talk a little bit about vaccinations. Everybody knows these are the three vaccinations we've got in the U.S., Pfizer, Moderna, I got a misspelling there, not Moderna, Moderna, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine by the company Janssen. Um, I got an email from somebody recently saying, why should I bother get vaccinated? Because there's no difference between, you know, because the vaccination is not preventing illness, there's no difference between getting vaccinated or not. I'm not sure where that person got that information because we have very, very good data that shows um, if you're vaccinated, you are much less at risk for any of these here, disease, hospitalizations, and death. So if you look at the set of bars on the left, the blue bars are the people that are vaccinated and the green bars are the people that are unvaccinated. And it shows you the on the left, the disease, the number of cases. So there are eight times more cases in unvaccinated than vaccinated. So very many fewer people who are vaccinated are getting the infection. The middle set of bars shows the difference between hospitalization. So the green bar is very high, showing very many hospitalizations in the Delta and very, very few hospitalizations in in the um, unvaccinated, sorry, not with Delta, I'm sorry, in the unvaccinated compared to vaccinated. So vaccinated people, these vaccines are fantastic at preventing hospitalization. And then on the far right is death. The vaccines are really also very good at preventing death. And this shows you this green bar is deaths among people who are unvaccinated and the blue bar is people who are vaccinated. One thing that I do wanna mention um, and made me think of it by looking at this reference at the bottom that this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. One of the things that we do in academia is we get good at being able to distinguish um, good studies from studies that were not carried out um, as robust as a word we use, not, they, they weren't as high quality. And we know which journals publish the high quality studies. This is one of them, the New England Journal of Medicine. You cannot get in your article into the New England Journal of Medicine um, unless, you know, whenever we submit scientific articles to journals, they go out for peer review. So that means they find other scientists, they take your name off the paper, they give it to two or three other scientists who read it, and, and critique it. And then you have to make changes based on the critiques and it does not get published until you address those critiques. And then it will finally get will finally get published. So, and one of the questions that critiquers get added, asked is, is this paper important enough to go in our journal? And is it as it well enough carried out to go in our journal? So New England Journal is one of these that I never in my lifetime will be able to publish in because I'm not smart enough, basically. Um, but I do get concerned when people say, well, I found this on the internet and I found this and I found this graph. And so they say, well, anything you can show me, I can show you something different. What I come back with is, um, well, the stuff I'm showing is really high quality stuff. And I'm happy to look at anything that other people are finding, but something like this in the New England Journal, this is not, and, this is not the only scientific study showing this difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated. This is appearing over and over again in the scientific studies in the four or five most prestigious scientific journals. That's where we talk about, you know, where is the truth in all this? Who's right? Whose science should we follow? I think people are having trouble with that because there's so much on the web, so much stuff on the web. And I will just say in one of the reasons um, we go into academia because we're kind of nerdy and we really like looking at studies and judging, you know, which ones are quality and which ones are not. And you get good at being able to judge that. So enough on that. All right. So here's another question. Do the vaccines work against the Delta variant? Their studies are coming out, although it's slow. That's another thing that I, I do have to remind people is that this stuff is happening really fast in the scientific world, and it's hard to get things published quickly. You got to make sure all your data is correct, and you got to do all the mathematical calculations to make sure there wasn't anything that was biasing your results 
or making you um, think that there was one outcome when there really wasn't, if you don't look closely enough. So there are studies being published. And this issue of is does the vaccine work amount against the Delta? It really looks so far like it does. It works really well. This one study in the first box came out a couple of weeks ago um, of um, a bunch of people who had the Pfizer vaccine and they calculated, researchers calculated that it was 88% um, effective against having symptoms with the Delta and 96% effective against hospitalization with Delta. The Pfizer originally um, with the other variants is about 95% effective against symptoms. So you're losing a little bit of efficacy down to 88%, but it's still working great against hospitalization. One thing I also wanted to mention is most of our vaccines, I mean, this vaccine works fantastic compared to other vaccines. You know, the flu shot sometimes only is 60% efficacious. So the fact that we got over 90% on our first try with these vaccines shows that these vaccines are fantastic. And a lot of people are just thinking this was just miraculous how well this vaccine has worked with so few side effects. Um, Moderna has, there have been some, uh, has been a study on the Moderna vaccine to look at its, how well it works against Delta. It hasn't been published yet, but the, they, they released like a press release saying it looks like it works pretty well. We're going to publish it soon. And the same thing with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that it's a little less effective against Delta down to 67%, um, which is still okay as far as a uh, vaccine goes, if you have 90% of the population that has it, they haven't published it yet. So um, most people think the vaccines or most people are seeing that the vaccines work pretty well against Delta. They definitely work well against death and hospitalization from Delta. Who is at risk of infection with the Delta variant? So I think I've, I've shown that it's unvaccinated people who are most at risk. So let's talk about who can get the vaccine and who can't get the vaccine. Because I've seen this phrase a lot in workplaces of, you know, we're going to socially distance because there might be people who are unable to get the vaccine. When I started seeing that, I went back to the CDC website to look again at what the contraindications were because um, I wanted to make sure they hadn't changed. And what basically I found was the same thing that we found, you know, six months ago, that there are very, very few reasons that you cannot get the vaccine. So who can't get it? If you've had an allergic reaction to the first dose, a severe allergic reaction to the first dose, and or if you've had an allergic reaction to these components of the vaccine, polysorbate and polyethylene glycol. These are very unusual components. They do not appear in a lot of vaccines. So most of us haven't come across polysorbate or polyethylene glycol, which is why they saw some of the bad um, allergic reactions at the beginning and why you have to be observed. So when you get one of the mRNA vaccines, you have to be observed for 15 to 30 minutes to make sure you don't have one of these allergic reactions. So pretty much everyone else can get the vaccine. There are people for whom the vaccine might not work well because their immune systems are turned off, either because they have a disease that turns off their immune system like HIV, like AIDS, or they're taking medicines that turn off their immune system. Like if you have um, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, lupus, sarcoidosis. Those are diseases that are treated with drugs, medications that turn off your immune system because your immune system is attacking your body. That's what's happening with those diseases. So if you get a vaccine and your immune system is already kind of turned off, your body might not make enough antibodies. You should still get the vaccine because your body will make some antibodies. There is no danger to getting the vaccine if you have those conditions or if you take those medicines. That's not the issue that they're talking about with immunocompromised people. They're talking about the fact that your body might not make enough to fight the virus. And that's why there may be recommendations coming soon within the next month or so that recommends a third vaccine for those people. So to really give their immune systems a chance to make enough antibodies so that they can fight the infection when they see it. So, because what the vaccine does, I probably should have um, gone through this as well. The vaccine works by stimulating your own immune system to make antibodies. So it puts a little, it makes your body make little pieces of that spike protein, not the whole virus, just the spike protein. It makes your body, your cells make pieces of the spike protein, which then stimulates your immune system to say, hey, there's something foreign here. We gotta make antibodies to kill it. 
So then you, you have these antibodies that last in your body for, a, well, it sounds like at least eight months now. And so when you get the real virus, when your body sees the real virus, those antibodies kill it instantly. So if your immune system is not reacting, you might not make enough. Bottom line, if you're pregnant, you can get the vaccine. If you have cancer, you can get the vaccine. If you have heart disease, bad asthma, um, have MS, have um, all kinds of different diseases, you can and should get the vaccine. So just a couple of slides about vaccine hesitancy, and then we can um, talk about some, may maybe do questions and then cases, or if people have cases they want to propose, I can talk about them. I, wanna, I found this from the WHO, the World Health Organization, back in 2019 before COVID, that identified vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 global health threats. So people who are reluctant to get the vaccines um, on a global level is causing health threats throughout the planet. So the next slides are some of the reasons that people are reluctant to or nervous about getting the vaccine. So the first one is they're worried about safety and efficacy, mainly that the vaccine got emergency use authorization and did not get full approval from the FDA. And the reason is that this was happening so fast. Once again, it was like miraculous. They came, you know, they were looking at the DNA of this virus one month into the outbreak in China. They had the DNA code figured out and they were starting to work on vaccines. So it happened really, really fast. Um, they tested it in tens of thousands of participants. So 30,000, several different studies had 30,000 participants each before it was approved for emergency use. So that's a lot of a lot of people that you can look for side effects in. The other thing that concerns people, they think this the mRNA, the Pfizer and Moderna are brand new and that we're being experimented on. Whereas the mRNA vaccine technology has been used in animal research for 30 years and human research for, for 10 to 20 years. So we it has been around, it's not brand new. It just hasn't been used in vaccines, vaccines uh, successfully before. They've been trying to make a vaccine for working on rabies and Ebola and HIV with mRNA and have not been successful. Some people have a preference for natural immunity. So they say, well, I know I won't, I don't think I'll get COVID a severe infection and then I'll make my own antibodies and there's a belief that the risk of the vaccine is greater than the risk of disease. I'll just get the disease. Um, for the full, first bullet, you definitely have some natural immunity after getting the infection up to 90 days. That's why after 90, you, within 90 days, you're not supposed to, you know, if you get exposed to somebody, you don't need to get tested again because you just had it. Within 90 days, you're not going to get it again. You got your own natural immunity. But it does look like the immunity that you build up from the vaccine, from getting the vaccine, is much stronger and lasts much longer than when you get the infection yourself. So your own natural immunity is not stronger than what you get from the vaccine. And we do know that the risk of the vaccine is not greater than the risk of the disease, as we saw in the graph with all those bars between the risk of hospitalization and death between vaccinated and unvaccinated. Another reason is distrust in government and health organizations, and that is a huge problem and warranted in some instances where there are entire populations who were experimented on by um, health organizations and the government so that is warrant is warranted. It's very unfortunate in this case. And there's a lot of disinformation and conspiracy theories out there. That is, you know, and now the government is trying to talk to Facebook and Twitter and trying to get the people who are putting out this misinformation, trying to get them kicked off because it's causing so much harm, so much distrust. There are challenges to access to the vaccines. We're really trying, the government is trying to get better at that by mobile vans and putting them in pharmacies and hopefully getting out to churches and neighborhoods and making it really easy to get the vaccine. But there, we, the, our country has plenty of vaccines. There is no shortage of vaccines. We just gotta get them into arms. There's this issue of personal liberty. People say, um, I want my own autonomy. This is personal freedom. It's my body. I get to decide what goes into it. I think what's not, and that is all true. And that is all very important to respect. Um, one part of it I think is not appreciated is that in this case, unlike, um, for example, if you decide to be a smoker and you smoke by yourself, that is your personal liberty. In this case, you are transmitting it to other people if you're not vaccinated and you get it. So you're putting other people at risk. So that needs to be taken into account and balanced against the personal liberties. <clears throat> so when talking to people about vaccination, 
When people feel their opinion is heard and valued, they may be more inclined to consider vaccine a personal choice rather than a coercion. There are definitely people who, well, nobody likes to feel like they're being coerced. They wanna be making a personal opinion, personal choice. And the personal choice is gonna come about if people feel their opinion is heard and valued. So that's really important. Um, just a quick slide on breakthrough infections. So that's, we're seeing a lot of talk in the media about that. So as of July 26, the CDC received 6,587 reports of breakthrough infections. So that's people who've had a positive COVID test, even though they've been vaccinated, fully vaccinated. So 6,587 resulted in hospitalization or death. So it's a lot, Six, over 6,000 people have been hospitalized or died. But that's in 163 million fully vaccinated people. So when you do the math there, that's a rate of 0.01% or less. So that is actually what you expect for a vaccine that is 95, around 95% efficacious. That's the percentage of um, infections where people, the vaccine didn't work in them because the vaccine's not 100%. There are going to be some people for whom it doesn't work and it's around 0.01% or less. That is one in 10,000 people. The breakthrough infections are not occurring um, more than we expected. And then my last slide is on the Delta Plus. This is another variant that you're going to start hearing about. It does not, at least from what I read a week ago, it does not seem to be spreading as well um, as the Delta. So I'm not sure they should call it the Delta Plus. It's been found in the United Kingdom, India, South Korea, and the U.S. It may be more transmissible, but that it did not really, has not panned out in the U.K. It may be resistant to current vaccines, which is really bad. It seems to bind better to lung cells. So this is, um, if it's something, if it's more resistant to our vaccines, then this is something we don't want to spread around. The more people are unvaccinated, the higher the risk that more variants will form. So in other words, these mutations occur when you've got virus in the community of unvaccinated people. So the more people that get vaccinated, we can, we can tamp down these mutations. And the variants and mutations, they're gonna happen. And the virus is gonna eventually, our, our, our um, vaccine's not gonna work against it. We're gonna have to make a different vaccine. So that is coming, but we can prevent it and slow it down by getting everybody vaccinated and the virus just doesn't have anywhere to mutate because it can't get into humans. Do we need to wear masks? Sorry, I thought that was my last slide. I guess I got, I guess I got one more. Do we need to wear masks? So everybody knows that, w, uh, that the U, U.S. Centers for Disease Control, CDC now says, vaccinated or not, wear masks in public indoor areas in areas of high transmission. And I showed you that graph of the US where all of it's gonna be red now, meaning for almost the entire country, not the entire country, almost the entire country is now area of high transmission. I've put back, I put my mask back on in the grocery store. I'm really bummed about it. I went, what, probably a month going to the grocery store without my mask. Now it's back on. The WHO has always said to keep masks on until this thing is over with, regardless of whether you're vaccinated. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can go back into the larger group. And I understand that people can't show their videos, which is kind of a bummer, um, so that we can't see each other. But um, does someone wanna move us to the next stage here? Great, well, at this point, thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Buchanan, that was great. At this point, folks, those of you who are on this call, you can unmute yourself. Uh, during the presentation, I am kind of like the mute police, and I just kind of make sure that you're muted so we can properly hear uh, the presentation. But at this time, if you have any questions for Dr. Buchanan, please, please, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, if you're not comfortable with asking that question out loud, please feel free to put it in the chat for the Q&A, and I will be more than happy to read it out loud and have that answered for you. We do want to take a few moments and, and give you that ability to ask any questions. And if not, then we'll move forward uh, with a case study where I will stop the recording. Okay, looks like we have a question. When does it seem like the vaccines will be FDA approved? Once these are FDA approved, do you think they will become mandatory? Um, they're very close. Pfizer is very close to, be, to getting approved. It, they were saying like it was gonna take until December, but now they've sped up their process and it's going to be hopefully within the month that the Pfizer will be fully FDA approved. Um, Moderna will probably be a few months behind that. 
And I don't think J and J has a. I'm not sure if they've applied for full approval yet. I don't. Will they become man, mandatory when they're fully approved? You know, no vaccine is mandatory in the United States. They are mandatory for certain situations. So for children to go to school. So I mean, you can say that that's mandatory, but. If you homeschool your kids, I don't, I'm pretty sure you don't have to have them vaccinated. There are some, so I don't, and I don't know if the COVID-19 vaccine will get added to that list of children's vaccinations that are required to go to school. Probably. I mean, it makes sense. We require all these other vaccines that are, don't work as well. Um, and this one works really well. So, you know, measles, chicken pox, all the um, hepatitis B, hepatitis A now, all that's required. Um, so I can imagine that that would get added, but I'm not part of that decision making so i don't know um workplaces i think workplaces probably more workplaces will require it certainly healthcare um hospitals they're holding back because it's only emergency use authorization although the eeoc has very clearly stated that workplaces can require the vaccine even though it's emergency use authorization nobody's going to get sued there's no liability so um I know of, you know, we're hearing in the news more and more workplaces that are requiring them, the universities, we cannot get in the door here um, with our with our flip with our uh, swipe cards unless we have already turned in our vaccine vaccination information. So um, I, I imagine that will pick up. I'm also getting another question here that says, what information do you have on when children under the age of 12 will be able to be vaccinated? You know, I keep hearing a few more months, in a few months, in a few months. Back in the spring, they were saying that it might receive its EUA by school starting. Looks like that's not going to happen. The data that, the, or kind of the word that's been put out with the studies is that the vaccine works really well in children and very, very few side effects. So things are looking really good for the use in children. I am I would say within a few months. Great, thank you. We do have a comment that says, uh, I know there's been some trials with children on the vaccine. Have there been any issues with those trials? Um, well, that's where that information is coming from, where it's working really well and very, very few side effects. Children are less likely to get that illness with the second shot or even the first shot. You know, they don't get, they don't as often get that fever and fatigue that we, that a lot of us got. There is a, there was a heart inflammation that is seen in um, some post-vaccination within two weeks of vaccination, some myocarditis it's called, and the levels were really, really low. So once again, they're saying the risk of getting COVID-19 is way higher than the risk of getting myocarditis. And the kids that got myocarditis resolved in two weeks, they all did fine. So things are, are looking good. Any other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or please feel free to go ahead and put that in in the chat. I'm getting some questions here. Would the dose change for kids? Gosh, I don't know the answer to that. Probably. I should look that up. Sorry. I don't know that, you know, they, I'm not sure those studies and kids have been published yet where I could look, but I haven't looked. Some of our vaccines are lower dose in children, the vaccines that we have already. I also have another question for you. You mentioned that it was safe to take the vaccine when you are pregnant. Was there a trial with pregnant and breastfeeding mothers? So among those 30,000 people that were in the original studies to get the emergency use authorization, there were women who got pregnant during that study. And so they followed them and they published the data, the results on them, and there were not higher risks on them. Since, those, since the initial EUA, they have published more studies that are also showing that the risk of infection with COVID is um, a lot higher than any risk of problems there have not been, a, there's nothing about infertility. There's no pregnancy loss. I think those are the biggest fears that people have that'll cause a miscarriage or for those who are thinking about preg getting pregnant, that'll cause infertility. That has not panned out. That has not been seen in any studies. So ACOG, the um, American Congress on OBGYNs, you know, their professional organization is recommending the vaccine. Oh, sorry. Also, again, sorry. I wanted to mention that once you get vaccinated, if there's a side effect that lands you in their doctor's office, they report it to the CDC under this vaccine side effect huge database. 
So there are lots of people are getting pregnant that are vaccinated. And so all that data is going to the CDC and they're following it and they're not finding anything either. Great. Thank you. Another question is, will there be a smaller dose for the booster for people who have already received their shots? I don't think so. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I don't think so. I don't know the answer to that. The dose, the dose to me doesn't really seem to matter. They create a dose because all of our immune systems are different and they need to create a dose that covers everybody's immune system. So a lower dose, a lot of people will make antibodies even at a lower dose, but some people won't. So they give a higher dose just to make sure that all of us, the greater num greatest number of people can react with making enough antibodies. Great, thank you. All right, I don't see any other questions at this time. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna stop the recording of this session.